The circle is cast, the candles lit, the spell is spoken, and Mother Moon is watching all that we say and do. For the next short passage of time, you are in an enchanted place called the Witching Hour. Hi, this is Elle. This is Bill. And we have a couple of really, really wonderful pieces for you today. Um, and it's wonderful because these pieces were written by a very dear friend of ours who happens to also um, produce this podcast, the Witching Hour, Witching Hour podcast. And so um, a lot of you don't know that he's a prolific writer. He has other podcasts. But right now we want to go with a piece that he wrote on October 21st, uh, 2019. And it's called Do Unto Others. No, seriously, Do Unto Others by Rob Steele. Here we go. This entry is pretty much just an amalgamated conversation I've had several times over the years. It usually starts with a podcast I produce called The Witching Hour. The subject of the show? Modern Paganism. I think it's a very interesting show. I'm just an engineer on it. Really, I do none of the programming or subjects, and I find it fascinating. Unfortunately, there are people who get weirded out by the subject and wonder why I'm not doing a Christian show. That's where the issues begin. I don't do a Christian show because no one's asked to do one. That's because it would be associated with that witchcraft show you do. No self-respecting Christian would want to be associated with witchcraft. Why not? Because they believe in magic, of course, and God said there's no magic. Really? When did he say that? <laughs> it's in the Bible. Where? Well, never mind. You won't find it. It's not there. Anyway, you're a Christian. You believe in magic. I mean, don't you pray? Isn't that like casting a spell? We are praying to the one true God. This is usually followed by his name being Jesus Christ and my retort about how Christians can't count because Jesus is really part of the one in three transformable God. But we'll skip most of that bit. So, you're asking a divine force for intervention on your behalf. And that's different spell casting? How? Because we are asking God. But they're asking their God. Why isn't that okay with you? I mean, if nothing else, less strain for your God, right? But what they are doing is sacrilegious. Well, maybe to you. But this is their religion. We have the freedom to worship however we want to in this country. Theirs says they can ask a divine force for assistance pretty much just the same as yours. What's wrong with that? They use, they use incense and crystals and goblets. Oh, uh, let me see. You use incense, wafers or bread, and goblets. Crystals are prettier than your wafers or bread. Certainly tastier than wafer. That's a win for them in my book. <laughs> the founding fathers of this country said that this was to be a Christian nation, so that's what we're going to have. Actually, they're the ones that wrote the freedom of religion thing, making all religions okay, from Christianity and Judaism to paganism. And whatever that flying spaghetti monster thing is. I've seen that on the net. Is the last one real? Honestly, I don't know. But if that's what they want to do, why are you so interested in stopping them? Because my religion is the one true religion. According to you, they like theirs. What you're saying is that you want to invoke Sharia law. <gasps> I'm Christian. I do not want to do that. Well, Sharia law says there should only be one religion. You say there should only be one religion. Yours. No one else's. No freedom of religion. What about the Constitution? I mean, just because you changed the name, it's really the same thing. It's very different. This is Christian. Well, if we're really honest here, you're not very Christian. Uh, what is that supposed to mean? Well, one of the main tenets of your religion is to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Right? Matthew 7, 12, wasn't it? If they are Christian. Actually, the full verse is, All things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. Not only if they're Christian. If they exist at all. White, black, gay, straight, man, woman, tattooed. Christian or not. That actually is in your Bible. 
Well, that's not how I learned it. That's a you issue. Let's look at it this way. You like country music, right? Damn right I do. Uh, well, frankly, I can't stand it. it. Irritates me to no end. But you have the right to listen to country music all you want. I'm not stopping you from doing that, am I? Well, no. And it's the same concept here. They want to worship that way. Why not let them? Listen to the show. You might even find out that you're not so different. Well, what's that supposed to mean? Well, they teach peace and tolerance, and one of the big tenets in their religions are do unto others. They stole that from us. Well, they predate you by quite a lot, so if anything, you stole it from them. But the big difference is they're practicing it. Maybe you should give that a shot. Well... You're not going to go to hell for listening to a podcast. These pagans won't uh, curse me to hell? Well, they don't believe in hell. Why would they curse you to something that doesn't exist? Hmm. The gist of all these conversations is that, really, we need to all be mindful of what others want to believe. Not all Christians believe the exact same thing. If they did, we wouldn't have all the divisions we do. Catholics, Baptists, Episcopals, Methodists, Mormons... They're all Christian one way or another, but they're divided for reasons I don't understand. Some are tolerant and some are not. The ones that aren't really can claim Christianity. That whole do unto others thing, remember? Jesus said that, and I suspect he got the idea from a pagan. Remember, there were a lot more of those back then, and Jesus didn't damn a single one of them, did he? Thank you very much, and Rob, I hope we did that justice, and we want to read a second one by Rob Steele, and he wrote this on August 28, 2019, and Bill and I will just trade off the um, the paragraphs, okay? I'm going to start. This is called Symbolism. Are you sure? Some of you may have noticed that I'm not really big on the whole God, Jesus, and religion thing, and you're right, I'm not. Now, this is Rob speaking, remember. Um, But there are a number of reasons that I'll be telling you about. But first, if you happen to be religious, I'm not knocking your belief. If you want to, that's your right, First Amendment and all that, right? I don't have a problem with your wanting to believe in a higher power. Granted, I was told as a child to stop believing in imaginary friends. But if you want to... Knock yourself out. And I'm already hearing some of you type, But Rob, you produce a religious show called The Witching Hour. It's pagan, but it's a religion. This is true. I'm not really pagan myself, but I do agree with a lot of their philosophy, which happens to be shared across most religions. The whole do unto others thing is a great idea, and that's what most religions boil down to. Not many people follow it, and that's where the issues come in. Incidentally, I think the main reason I'm not a full-blown pagan is that a lot of their rituals and beliefs involve being outside in nature. And I'm allergic to damn near everything outside. Pollen, grass, trees, bushes, animals with fur, animals with feathers, but I digress. What I want to talk about is the religion I grew up with, not specifically Episcopalianism, but Christianity as a whole. I found more holes in this religion than in most Swiss cheese factories find in their production line. Today, and there will be other days, I want to talk about the big symbol of Christianity, the cross. Yes, I know the story. Jesus Christ, not his real name, incidentally, that's just a translation, was crucified, which means he was literally nailed to a cross. Big spikes through his hands and ankles while he hung there to die. When did this happen? On a somewhat mobile holiday called Good Friday? I really don't get the naming convention used for that. Good? Are you sure? Your Savior died on this day and it's good. Yay! The Son of our God is dead! Oh, God. Three days later, he rose from the dead and may or may not have gone to Utah or Delaware because when you come back from the dead, you deserve a vacation. Actually, while we're here... Let's look at that last sentence again. Because when you come back, Jesus came back from the dead. Came back 
implying that he was here in the first place. So logically speaking, and I know logic is something that makes the church uncomfortable, Jesus came to earth on Christmas. That's a first coming. Then came back on Easter. There's your second coming. I'm pretty sure you've heard of it. So really, those people with the waiting for the second coming signs are about 2,000 years too late. That's another one of my Christian issues. You guys don't seem to be able to count to two. Meanwhile, at the point of this blog entry, we come back to the cross. It came to symbolize Christianity. Is that really a good idea? That's the thing that Jesus was nailed to for three days. It killed him, literally. If he comes back, do you really think that's what he's going to want to see? Oh, look, an effigy of me nailed to that piece of wood. That's lovely. To me, this is somewhat akin to having your Savior be Abraham Lincoln and the religious symbol be a stovepipe hat with a bullet hole in it. Huh. And how about all those other crucifixions? Jesus was one good guy on a cross, but a lot of others killed that way were thieves, rapists, and murderers. Do you really want to use that as a symbol when it could really just be as easily related to all of those others? What if one of them came back? Steve, the murdering rapist, returns to find millions of people using his murder weapon as a symbol. Really? Are you sure? There has to be a better symbol. How about some of his works? Bringing people together despite their differences. An inclusive logo. Like a rainbow? Or maybe something about how he was into health care, as evidenced by him healing people like the blind and lepers? An ambulance, maybe. A big hand like the one he laid upon the sick. That should work. Incidentally, those pastors and televangelists that do the laying on of hands to heal sick people, why do you never see them in hospitals just healing the sick like Jesus would have done? And if our, there are people who actually have done that, um, please forgive us. Uh, we don't know, but it's possible. Just possible. There are too many issues here for me, says Rob. And I am stealing this last bit from the Internet, but it fits so perfectly. Christianity, to me, is the popular belief that a celestial Jewish baby, yes, he was Jewish, who is somehow also his own father, born from a virgin mother, died for three days so he could ascend into heaven on a cloud and then make you live forever, but only if you symbolically eat his flesh and drink his blood cannibalism and vampirism, while telepathically telling you, accept him as your Lord and Master so he can remove an evil force from your spiritual being that is present in all humanity because an immoral woman made from a man's rib was tricked by a talking reptile possessed by a malicious angel to secretly eat forbidden fruit from a magical tree. And this story has spent almost two millennia getting people up on a weekend morning to go to a usually cold stone building and mumble prayers in his general direction while doing a fairly ineffective calisthenics program. Sit, kneel, stand, sit, stand, kneel. Hey, if it works for you, knock yourself out. I'll be in bed. And we understand that this, for our Christian friends out there, <laughs> may be a little hard, maybe a little too thought-provoking. I don't know, uh, but it was not meant in malice, trust me. Okay, so we are getting ready at the end of this month to celebrate what pagans call Samhain. And I'm not going to go through the whole Samhain story or any part of it, but I am going to tell you a scary story. How's that? A very short scary story and a couple of scary uh, poems. So, here we go. Some of these you may have heard. When the riddle fields are gathered and gleaned from the shadow of a killing freeze and twilights fall to copper moons that dance with barren trees... When comes the final harvest home beneath the silvery light, when weary feet tread that dusky road, jack-o'-lantern walks the night, 
And that's from The Four Jacks by Emerald Rose. Black cats and goblins and broomsticks and ghosts. Covens of witches with all of their hosts. You may think they scare me. You're probably right. Black cats and goblins on Halloween night. From the movie Halloween. And now for a couple of very short stories. Um, I had done a challenge uh, with my book, um, my book club, my book group. And um, this one of the, cha- the last challenge this month was for them to write a short, scary story. They did pretty well. Maybe they didn't quite get what I was talking about. If any of them were listening, here's what I was talking about. This is called The Rules. I know my parents love me, and I'm lucky they look after me so well. I don't mean to be so ungrateful. It's just that other parents seem more relaxed, and I resent that mine are so strict. I know why. It's because I'm an only child. Well, sort of. My younger sister ran away so long ago, I don't remember her very well. But my parents say she was rebellious, not like me. I'm their good girl. It's a lot of pressure. There are a lot of rules. The ordinary ones, like clear your plate and be in by bed by eight, aren't so bad. But some are stranger. Like, you know, don't walk around the house at night and never go into the basement. I'm a teenager, but they still treat me like a kid. They don't realize I'm getting older, noticing more. They don't know I found out where they hide the keys. So tonight, I'm breaking the rules. My heart pounds as I tiptoe down the stairs and open the basement door. I don't know what scares me more, seeing that my sister never ran away or hearing my father behind me saying, I'm very disappointed in you. (laughs) Yeah, this was written by the Fickle Mermaid. The second one is entitled, There's a Stranger Living in My House. No, well, it's not me. (laughs) There's a stranger living in my house. Food goes missing from my kitchen. My underwear drawer gets dumped out on the floor regularly. I hear footsteps in my attic and breathing from my vents at night. I called the cops once. When they pulled the vagrant's corpse from my attic, I thought everything would stop. It didn't. He must have had an accomplice that the cops didn't catch. Someone that's still hanging around. Even if it doesn't explain how the TV turns on and off, and why the window shutters rattle, even when there's no wind. And the glowing eyes I sometimes see through the air vent slats. There must be a stranger living in my house. And it's by Reed Archvillain. I hope you enjoyed those. I really do. I only have one thing to leave you with this evening, and that is... This, I'm going to let Bill read it because he kind of, um, well, anyway, I think he can read it better than I can. Okay, sweetie, there you go. This was a post on, actually, on our on our uh, uh, site on uh, that we have on, on our uh, Facebook page. It's entitled, Please Remember That Witchcraft is All About Intent. Stop overthinking it. You don't need fancy tools or to find the perfect spell. You can try to memorize what all the crystals do, what all the herbs are good for, what each moon phase corresponds with. But if it doesn't ring true to you, then it will have no effect. So make sure you give everything your own interpretation, one that makes sense to you. You can decide that Labradorite supports inner beauty because the hidden flashes of color that time helps you have time to appreciate the small things or that the waxing moon encourages plant growth as the moon grows larger. Deciding what feels right to you and infusing your intention into its use will be much more beneficial than half-heartedly regurgitating something because it's correct. That's wonderful, darling, and thank you, and thank you for listening. Now is the time to blow out the candles, pack our herbs, close our book of spells and fold our tents. But before I go, we'd really like to hear from you. We'd like to know what you'd like to hear from us on the show and how often. We'd also like to hear from you if you are involved in the pagan community and have something you'd like to share with the listening audience. It's even possible that you could come and do a guest shot on The Witching Hour. Contact us through the website, thewitchinghour.com. I also have to thank the team of magicians 
who help put this show together every time we do one. Rob Steele, Lee Vowell, and the Happy Hour Network for hosting this program. There are links to both their pages on our page, thewitchinghour.com. And until we meet again, stay magical. Stay magical.